All right. We are near the end of the day, so we have to be lively. We have to tell jokes, and then we have to kind of move around and dance a little just Great. to keep the audience interested. Great. Happy to do it. All right. Eric, you are CEO of a company now. Well, you've been CEO of many companies, but a company now called Tempest Labs. Yep. That is one of the largest sequencers of uh, cancer samples in the country, in the world. Yep. What box does that company go in? Is it a tech company? Is it a biology company? It's a care company? It's a data company? What is it? Yeah, the, so the, the, it's, it's kind of interesting because the, the, the box is a new box. So, um, you know, historically there were tech companies and there were uh, healthcare companies. And because technology hadn't really permeated healthcare in a big way, there really isn't like a combination of both. And I think Tempest is one of the first true combinations of both where we are certainly a tech company at heart, but we're also stooped in healthcare. Like we sequence patients, we deliver, you know, clinical reports. We are bound by all the same stuff that a lab would be bound by. But it, it is complicated. I mean, we have all kinds of people say, which one are you? And the answer is, we're entirely both. So when you started off, I mean, obviously, we've talked on this stage before about the you know, remarkable story of a personal experience leading to something that literally is changing how we care for cancer. Um, but one of the things that you know, I watched you do was start to take medical records and try to convert them into structured data taking these you know, medical records, you know, if you don't know what a medical record is, it's a PDF, a PDF file. And so converting a piece of paper into data. So tell us about that travail. I don't think people really understand the heroics of what you guys did there with that cancer data set. No, thank you. I mean, and, and so, so like we were talking about this before we got out here, when you look inside a typical uh, EHR system, it is, um, to quote somebody else, a bag of words. Uh, and that's complicated, but we made a decision early on to migrate to these electronic healthcare record systems so fast for all the right reasons that we had to punt the tough stuff, which, which basically is physician progress notes, pathology reports, radiology reports, which are basically made up of physicians typing in what's really going on, meaning what drugs am I giving the patient, what response am I seeing, what kind of adverse events are being... Uh, are being are we noticed. And so all that is just an unstructured text. And when my wife was sick about seven and a half years ago, and when I, uh, when we and had her- Seven and a half Seven and a half years. Time and when she was sequenced, I had her sequenced at like four or five places. And not only did those people not agree, but it was completely disconnected from her, uh, from her clinical, the, the clinical data surrounding her. Um, and I thought, this is just crazy. Like, these reports have no idea if she's a male or female, if she's old or young, if she has other issues going on. And so we set out to, the first thing we tried to do when we started Tempest was just see if we could in real time pull that data out of these electronic healthcare record systems, basically in un, that unstructured text, the words, and put them in some kind of structured format. So we, we picked about 100 data fields that we thought were relevant and we began structuring them and ended up building technology. That was really the first technology we built where we could structure those records in about an hour's worth of time because you can't use technology alone. You have to use technology plus some amount of human interaction. Humans? Humans, good old fashioned humans. So today we're almost 2,000 people but we have probably around the world uh, three or 400 abstractors that are you know, going through these notes and making sure- And they have a medical background? They typically, they're in pods or teams, and somebody in the pod or team typically has a medical background. They might be a nurse or a postdoc or PhD, whatever, but somebody has a medical background somewhere. And then you're training these junior abstractors to you know, go through the technology we built, which now is highly automated, but make sure that the fields are accurate. It's not perfect, but what, what's really interesting is um, this isn't the kind of data you'd use uh, for regulatory filing, right? It's not at that level. But what we said to people early on, which I think was a hard concept to, 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 to gather, if, you, if I structure a million patients' data, even, I don't, even though I don't do it perfectly, I'm not really worried about the noise. I'm worried about finding patterns that are statistically significant, where in and of itself, there's no way the pattern's wrong. And the same concept is what Google uses. If you go to Google and type in the word Jaguar, you get a cat or a car. You don't get the other zillion things it could be because Google basically regresses to the mean. It knows 
that you probably want a cat or a car. Well, it's listening in your house. That's, that's no. a separate issue. Yeah, separate issue. But uh, so we build technology that does that and it looks for those patterns that are relevant. We take those patterns and we basically bolt them onto the reports we provide physicians as insights that they're free to follow or not. So creating this large structured data set, very powerful. I mean, you could have been just a service company. There are many other players in this field, not to demean them, but they're a service company. You send them tissue, they give you, here are the genetics, but what you're doing is creating this large structured data set over time for what purpose? What's the goal? The goal is to make, the, 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 the real long-term goal is to make all diagnostics intelligent. I mean, really at the end of the day, if you think about it, there's only a few ways to bring AI to healthcare. You'd either ask doctors to go to the AI, right, which, which obviously Watson tried, uh, or you could try to make these EHR systems very intelligent, which Cerner may try. But these historically have been very hard for a whole bunch of reasons. And when we, when we started making genomic tests in cancer smart, we realized that we had stumbled into something much bigger, which is there's something else doctors interact with all day long when they make decisions. They literally, the key thing they interact with is some kind of new diagnostic results, some kind of laboratory test result, a CAT scan, an MRI, a blood test, a genomic test. This new data modality is often how they make critical decisions. If you can make that data modality intelligent, meaning it knows everything about the patient, then you can sneak AI into the US healthcare system. And the goal is to make you know, bad doctors good doctors and good doctors great doctors. And I, I really think that's the age that we're coming to, where physicians over the next maybe five or 10 years, 15 years, are gonna be unbelievably intelligent. Not because they weren't intelligent before, but because they really were oftentimes like performing their craft with both hands tied behind their back. When you give them enormous amounts of data, they will typically make the right decision. Well, thank you. I mean, those insults really make <laughs> me feel good, and I, I appreciate the, the criticism. It doesn't need it, really. It so, you know, one of the frustrations I have with what you do is I take care of cancer patients, and if you come to see me, you know, all of a sudden your cancer progressed from whatever treatment you were on, I stick a needle in, I biopsy you, and you're ready. You're scared to death. Your cancer is growing. And then three weeks later, I get a beautiful email from Tempest with some information. In those three weeks, it's chaos. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about how the field could change. Could we ever get to point of care sequencing where I could use the technology and know very quickly how to treat a patient? Yeah, I mean, you can. we for sure will get much faster. Our average turnaround today for uh, our solid tumor sequencing is about 10 days, and our average turnaround for liquid is about seven. But to a physician, it feels about four or five days longer because that's from the time we get the sample. So from the time you see a patient, you gotta get the sample, ship it to us, we have to sequence it. So you really do wanna shrink that so down it's from the US Postal weeks. Service's fault. It, well, it's actually, when you think about our 10 days, let's take our 10 days, um, the raw sequencing is about three. Mm -hmm. Right, so you lose about three days just in sequencing, and then the rest of it is just loading the sequencers and doing the. the, the, the well, animals. there's processing the sample. Processing. There's a lot of steps. So the only way you really shrink this down dramatically, there's only a few ways. One, either you do this at point of care, so you're you're saving that week of just the back and forth, or we create new sequencing technologies that's radically faster. And you guys had Oxford Nanopore here, I think, yesterday, but you, you, there are all kinds of new technologies that I'm sure will come over time that will allow us to do that much quicker. And companies like Tempest, given our scale, will, will gladly adopt whatever the best technology is. I mean, we're agnostic as to which technology we use. We just need to produce a clinically valid report in a, in a short amount of time as possible. So you know, one of the things that I think <clears throat> keeps being hammered in to people today is that genomics are tremendously important, but so is the study of protein, proteomics, the study of your metabolites, metabolomics, the study of your microbiome, the bacteria in your GI tract microbiomics. When will we be into this multi-omic analysis to be able to help us guide to treat diseases like cancer? So I would, this is a, uh, this is a guess, but it took us essentially 20 years to kind of get to the point that genomics matter. I think it's gonna take us 10 years to get to the point that transcriptomics or RNA matters. And then I would assume everything you just mentioned beyond that, epigenomics, microbiomics, proteomics will all be quicker, but the, it is like a seven layer cake or a, whatever the cake would be, where we had to start for all the right reasons with DNA, 
and now we're like, well, okay, let's go a, level, a layer up, and the layer up is RNA, and then the layer up is proteins, and we'll just keep working our way into the immune system and what's going on. But I think we had to start where we started. It's just taken a lot longer for all the reasons that you know, you know better than I do, just how slow the US healthcare system is, to really figure out how to make sense of the data and then turn it into drugs that are actually actionable. So when you say drugs, I mean, we call them druggable targets. I sequence your cancer, oh my gosh, there's an on switch I can turn off with this thing I have in my toolbox, a drug. What percent of patients actually have a druggable target? What percent of patients, when you give a result to a doc, does it change their clinical management or care? So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a huge spectrum. So we find something actionable uh, over 90% of the time meaning a clinical trial you could go on or a therapeutic. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really, though, change care the way you, you would think about it. The change care as in I'm going to durably extend someone's life is probably uh, somewhere between 10 and 20% of the time. Now, that might seem small, but if you're a cancer patient, it's a big deal, right? 10% is a big deal. But it's probably 10 to 20% of the time. And, and if you, when we got it, I've been doing this now for six years, so it's honestly like a ski slope up or down or whichever way the slope goes, where it's, that number is growing exponentially. So I would say if, we, if, we, if I come back here five or 10 years from now, if it's 15% today, I'll pick the midpoint, it'll be 35%, then it'll be 65%. Like, it could just basically, for, if you can think about it, every drug company is looking for an ever-increasing number of biomarkers that can make their drug work better. Uh, they don't want to have failed trials. They don't want to have failed drugs. And the, those, typically, those are molecular. So we're finding more and more molecular signatures that give rise to a good response. So by the way, I know you're from Chicago, and wind does weird things. But you normally ski down. You don't ski yeah, up. Yeah, I get that. I got that wrong. Um, so <laughs> pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, they're partners to you. Yeah. They are, they're obviously developing the drugs. But your relationship with them now is predominantly on the partnership side? Yeah, so, I mean, ha be, not being from the space, I think um, I had a very different view of this. I remember when we started signing up academic medical centers and NCI cancer centers to begin sequencing with us, the concept that you would license de-identified data to pharma was, like, toxic. Um, and I would say to them, I, I'm, I don't understand. What would, what would you do with the data? You guys don't make drugs. Wouldn't you want the data to go to the people that make drugs? You want to hide the data from the only people that actually make the drugs? You're telling the academic center. Yeah, and they're like, right. and they kind of look at you like, why don't, and I, it's, so I don't understand this whole world. Our job, because we now have one of the largest database healthcare in the world, at like 55 petabytes or something and growing a couple petabytes a month, but our job is to make this data, data available to anyone and everyone who can help a patient. It's, it is both appropriately consented, meaning patients have said you can, you can, you can have the data, and it's de-identified, meaning it isn't identified. So I think the, we've done a very good job in this country. It's, it's one of the few places where I think the regulators got it right in terms of how to control identified data for patients and not allow it to go anywhere, how to make sure it's appropriately de-identified, how to give the definition of that, and then let's let it Let's put it in the hands of anyone that can use it that actually can help patients. You know, I owe you a lot. I mean, we've had patients together who literally we've changed or you've changed their life, and I've just implemented what your data has said. You know, in fact, one patient who had another company do the test and found nothing, you did it because it's actually not that easy to do genomic sampling of cancer. You found something, and he stayed alive for six years. So, I mean, it literally is saving the life. But I've also had the other experience where I feel I've potentially harmed somebody through you, where I've done it, I've identified a target, and then the insurance company goes, well, we're not gonna pay for that drug because it was meant for kidney cancer, and they have liver cancer, and this person says, do I mortgage my house, my kid's future, or do I die with dignity now because I can't pay for that drug? And I feel guilty as hell when that happens. Yeah, I mean, uh, so do I. I think, I think the I fundamentally believe, look, we, when we started Tempest we, and we started to realize we were going to have one of the largest databases in the, in the world, you have to define the rules around that. Like one of those rules being we will license the de-identified data to anyone that could use it for a patient's behalf, on a patient's behalf. But we also had to decide 
what kind of data would, would, do you want to hold back? And we made a decision early on that we had to allow physicians to be the arbiters of that data. Our job was to give you all the data. Your job, and candidly, it's a tough job. I'm not a doctor, but your job is to figure out how to synthesize it. It's the reason we don't go directly to patients. It's confusing enough for a lot of physicians to make sense of 128 gigs of data, which is typically what's on those reports, let alone the average patient. So, you know, it is hard. And I think insurance companies are also having a hard time figuring out, you know, historically, you know, there used to be one subtype of cancer, then there were 20, now there's a couple hundred. But more and more, we're beginning to realize that our, our definitions of cancer are totally archaic. Yeah. And they, they can't figure that out as fast either. So I think they're, um, everyone's trying to grapple with this new reality of, of us defining how a patient might respond more by the molecular composition of the patient, not where the tumor arose or where it is today. So, you know, at, at the same time of helping people, you're also a company. And so, you know, you've had tremendous growth. Tempest, you know, it became from nothing to literally 53. How many of the NCI designated cancer centers are you working with now? Yeah, so it's probably 52 of the 72-ish. Pretty impressive. I mean, that is remarkable. And I assume at some point you will enter the public market, which you probably can't talk about, but we can all look at your face and see an answer. And it's looking at the water. Um, and, and what will that do? Say you do a tremendous IPO, you got towards more cash. Are there dream things you want to do that you're limited now or restrained now upon? Is there a new future we don't know about yet? No, I think, look, I think there's no new future. I think we are, um, we're in uncharted territory. Tempest has kind of gone to a place of actually bringing AI into the clinic that I don't think anyone has ever come close to going to. So You've done it in a usable way. That's what's cool. Yeah, and, and, but we don't know what it means or where it goes. We, we, we have a fundamental belief that this is going to matter in every disease area. So I think we're always cognizant of where should we go next. We went from cancer to neuropsych and neuropsych into infectious disease, infectious disease to cardiology. And each time you have to pick a new diagnostic, like our cardiology product is based on an EKG. In cancer, it's based on genomics. So, so we have to think that through. But I'm convinced that, um, that our, our job is, is, is clear, which is to go disease area by disease area try to make these diagnostics as smart as we can, work in partnership with physicians to figure out when are they stupid. Because some of the feedback we get from you which, and others, which is great, is this is really dumb. You shouldn't do this. Change this. Do that. And that's also, it has to be a two-way street. You, you know, technology and biology have never been truly married. And if you want to be a company that straddles both worlds, you have to, you have to you know, create that kind of a relationship. So um, we'll have to deploy capital intelligently to go disease area by disease area. So for the record, I never said what Tempest did was dumb. I just said goofy or <laughs> stupid. I never said dumb. Um, you know, as we end, I mean, we all in life has the opportunity of doing many things. And I think everybody in the audience is tremendously accomplished. And one of the things that I've learned in my short existence is you work with people you like because working with people who you enjoy being with, you get a lot more done. And so it has been a privilege working the two of us together because I like our time together. I enjoy it. I think we push each other, and I think getting people from your domain crossing over are where big advances happen. So I am actually privileged that you're in this space and putting your time to our field, which needed your kind of mindset to make change. So thank you for doing that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And thank you. Thank you.